Hello, and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast. I am Felicia Martin, the Vice President of the NCAA Eligibility Center, and also Interim Senior Vice President of Inclusion, Education, and Community Engagement. Throughout my career, I've made decisions that are student-athlete-centric. I've always been a believer in the power of education, the importance of integrity, and opening the doors of opportunity when it comes to professional endeavors. Leaders must educate themselves through programs, strategic relationships, and career experiences. As a woman of color, I've found that the right exposure and strategic networking can be instrumental in progressing to executive level leadership positions. We've created the NCAA Leadership Collective to provide exposure for our industry's most talented minority administrators and coaches. The NCAA Leadership Collective is a database that houses career profiles of ethnic minorities who are ready to step into major leadership roles. Qualified athletic administrators and coaches can create their professional profile in the collective and keep it up to date as they progress throughout their careers. Presidents, chancellors, conference commissioners, and athletic directors have access to each profile in the collective so they can build a comprehensive list of candidates for opportunities within their respective organizations. I encourage people to visit ncaa.org backslash leadership dash development to get more details on the NCAA Leadership Collective. This is an incredible resource for our industry. Be well. Greetings, this is Ty Brown and welcome to the One Question Leadership Podcast, where we highlight executive and organizational leadership. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at One Q Leadership. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, and review One Q wherever you listen to podcasts. Our guest today is Andrew Gavin. Andrew is the Director of Athletics at University of Wisconsin Parkside. Greetings, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Ty. Happy to be here. Andrew, you've been in that role for almost five years. You've been in the industry for roughly 15 years, right? Around there? Yeah. Spent all right. time at uh, Center College, working in advancement and internal relations, Wisconsin Green Bay, worked in communications. And you started in sports information at uh, Central Florida, I believe, uh, sports information director, and worked your way up through sports information, through external, and a number of different positions in that area. So I'm happy to have you on here. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about is really that start in sports information, right? Your roots as a professional are in sports information. And, and why do you consider that to be an important, I guess, b a beginning or springboard for where you are now in terms of your career? Yeah, absolutely, Ty. Um, happy to talk about that. I mean, I think there's a couple of different things that come to mind related to that question. I think first and foremost, communication is a critical piece of our lives, personally, professionally, um, in our success on a micro level, a macro level, we can't do anything in this world really without communicating. So I think just the, the skill set that, that comes from that work um, is really important. Specifically related to sports information in, in the college athletics world, um, I think first and foremost, the opportunity to be around student athletes, you know, my seven years in Division One. I traveled with teams on a regular basis. So you really get ingrained in what life is like for a coach, what life is like for those student athletes. So I think that's a really important piece that I can I can refer back to, relate to, whether that's a 10-hour bus ride, getting stuck at an airport, getting back to the hotel after a tough loss at, at midnight, those young men and women having to study, whatever those experiences are that you kind of, you really get to a sense of those uh, with life on the road and being that involved in some of those programs. So that's one piece. As it relates to the skill set, I think a few things come to mind. First of all, support staff. I, I still talk about my job as a member of our support staff here at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. That's the way I see our leadership team is we're the support staff for our student athletes and coaches. Um, and I think coming up through sports information, similar to athletic training, many other professions is you really wired to be that support staff. And I think that's a, a good starting point for doing good work. And then the communications piece is advocacy, right? I mean, as a sports information professional, media relations professional, it's really important in your work to be able to advocate. I don't know that there's any more important aspect of a director of athletics job than the ability to advocate and promote 
internally and externally, the needs, uh, the opportunities, the wants, the visions of an athletics department. Um, and that's the last piece. I think being able to clearly define and articulate and share both on a micro level, a macro level, the needs, the message that day, the, the vision, the strategic vision of the institution are really important. So I think for me, I'm really comfortable in that space. I'm comfortable whether it's the email I sent to our staff this morning about COVID protocols or whether it's, you know, developing documents to bring to the board, developing documents to bring to the chancellor or her cabinet about where I think we need to go um, with athletics, advocating the needs and, and articulating that. So I think for me, that, that communication skill set, uh, that experience in, in g- coming up through the industry um, gives me confidence in those areas where m- maybe otherwise I wouldn't have them. That's important. The narrative, advocating the support and really being entrenched with student athletes, right? Kept you tied to student athletes. And I think that all plays into what you have to do now as a leader of a department. I find that very interesting. You told me a story, speaking of narrative and stories, right? You told me a story about the beginning of your tenure as an AD, really just before the, you've been named AD. And so now you're coming into the chair and you got to go talk to everybody, press conference, whatever the first minutia is as a new AD trying to hop on a train that's already moving, right? And you thought about, that they may ask you questions that you didn't necessarily have the answers to. So I wonder how you handle questions. You knew that you wouldn't have the answers to, but you are the leader of the department. So you have to have some type of answers. Tell me about how you handled that as a new AD. What was that five years ago or something like that coming into the chair? Yeah. I mean, I I think it starts with, for me, uh, this opportunity came about much quicker than I thought it was going to. Um, So I just, uh, applied to be, I was a associate AD at Center College. You referenced earlier, my alma mater. Um, built a house, had our first kid, living close to my wife's family, kind of settling into that new new role there as a father and, and living there. And applied for the Pathway Program. I knew I wanted to be an athletic director. I knew that was a, a great opportunity to try to get in the Pathway Program through the NCA. Got in the Pathway Program in June. Pathway program started in July and I had the chance to interview for this position in July. So I was thinking two, three years down the road, I was going to maybe ha- have that opportunity to, to transition to the AD chair. All of a sudden, two weeks later, I get the job and accept the job. And, and that was really the, when I had that conversation with myself, which I think some of the most powerful conversations we, we have and need to have are those with ourselves and thinking about, I'm about to step foot on this campus as a 33 year old athletic director I had a schedule in my own mind and into a department that was going through some turmoil and some different things. And I knew I was going to about to get a lot of questions fired at me. And, and as you referenced, knowing that many of those, I wasn't going to know the answer to maybe because I'm a first time AD, maybe because I needed to learn the landscape. I needed to learn how chancellor Ford wanted to operate, needed to learn how some things played out in our department. Um, so I really need, I, I had this moment of self-reflection that while, while knowing going into this role that I'm going to have to say, I don't know a lot. I also need to be ar- able to articulate what I do know, what is important to me uh, about how I conduct my business, how I believe that my core values are going to be seen in this role on a day-to-day basis and, and kind of what I want our athletic department to be known for. So spend some time just thinking through that. Why do I want to be an AD? Why, why is this opportunity what, I, what I'm going to take on here? Um, and how do I articulate the core values of who I am and what I expect of our department? Knowing that the black and white expectations, the details those were going to be formed as time went on. Um, and that's really the evolution and the, the origin of Ranger Impact, uh, Impact being the core values that I kind of brought to this athletics department and, and how I hope we operate on our daily business. Yeah, that's interesting. Conversations with yourself are the most important conversations we can have, right? That's an interesting statement there. Um, you come in and, and you think about what I do know. And what I do know are what's important to me in terms of values and from my assessment of the department and the university, what I believe is important to the department university. And that's how you came across those initial core values and which I guess are still kind of leading you here five years later. Yeah, they absolutely are. And I mean, I think through the adversity of the last 18 months, um, you know, I don't think your your core values are going to show whether or not you're true to them through adversity. So I think And I referenced to you earlier in a conversation that, you know, I don't talk about them every single day, but I hope the actions of 
of myself as the AD of our leadership team and staff of our athletics department. I hope they're seen and I think they are, but that's going to be, be known during, through adversity. And I think as I've reflected on what we've done, what we've accomplished, what we've tried to navigate in the last 18 months, um, you know, I'm proud that those core values that I came up with pretty quickly to be able to articulate on August 1st of 2017, I feel like are certainly driving our athletics department and the decisions that we're making right now. Yeah, I think that's excellent. And while it may sound like you came up with them on the fly, the fact that they are still guiding principles today that helping you, helping you and the department maneuver through ups and downs and challenges and celebrations means that there actually was some thought into them. I want to dive in on this introspection thing, this conversation with yourself. Has that something that you've always done from when you were young or is that recent relative into your professional career? Or tell me a little bit about that part, the introspection, because there are some ADs out there who that's a big thing for them, right? Being able to sit down and have conversations with themselves, evaluating debriefing to yourself, thinking about the future, strategizing. Talk to me a little bit about that introspection. Yeah, it's a good. I don't know that I've ever been asked that question um, the way you <laughs> asked it in terms of have I always been like that? That's a good, that's a good question. I think the answer is probably yes. But really, it was just within the, the last couple of years prior to becoming an athletic director um, where I, I think I maybe became more aware of those conversations and, and became aware of the importance of, of self-reflection, self-reflecting probably started to focus my energy and my mindset more on my strengths and less on my deficiencies. I was a, a well below average division three student athlete. <laughs> I scored eight career points, career points, not in a game, not in a season in my career. I scored hey, that, eight points. Like, that's more than I did as an athlete. So, hey. <laughs> um, and that used to bother me thinking about stepping into the AD chair. I've never coached. That used to bother me about stepping into the AD chair thinking, how am I going to stand up in front of, right? So this moment where you think about, I'm on this side of the room, all of a sudden when you're in the AD chair, I'm on the other side of the room, standing up in front of whether it's student athletes or coaches. And I think I used to get caught up in my own lack of confidence about some of those things about my resume, right? It, none of which could be controlled. I'm not going to go back and, and score more points. I'm not going to go back and, and start over and, and, ex, and gain that experience as a coach. So it's really through self-reflecting and kind of some of those conversations with myself, some of the professional development that probably put some ideas in my head about how to really understand, you know, the disc assessment, which I was able to do at the national office of the NCAA. Um, some of those things that challenge you where I, I kind of came up with the phrase own your deficiencies. And I think now, and, and going back to our last or the first topic about my background, I know why coming up through communications is a really important part of why I can be good at this job. So I can, I think those conversations is just confidence building and becoming comfortable in your own skin, comfortable in, in what you're really good at and focusing on that is really, really important. Um, and acknowledging, and especially as you become an AD and you're building a team around you, um, you know, if, if you don't understand yourself, how are you going to build a team that complements your strengths and weaknesses? Uh, and I think that's, that's really, really important. We've been blessed here in my time at Parkside to be able to hire and bring on some uh, amazing uh, colleagues, young colleagues for the most part, young in their careers. But, you know, I think we all complement each other pretty well through strengths and weaknesses with, with a lot of the same driving force, a lot of the same foundational things that we care about in terms of helping student athletes and impacting our community, impacting our, our university, but through very different strengths and weaknesses. Now, you've been in that external area, right? You start off as an SID and you work your way up. You've done some fundraising. You, I mean, just a number of those different things that are involved in the external side of an athletics department. But what I know about you is that you feel like the internal areas of athletics are some of the most important when you talk about the uh, intercollegiate athletics, you talk about a department on campus, you talk about enhancing the academic mission of a university and creating a great student athlete experience. Talk to me about that philosophy that you have relative to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you're right. My, my role in terms of what my job titles were and kind of most of my day-to-day -day work were, were very externally focused uh, from the beginning of my career until I stepped foot in this job. And um, But I think what's what's really important about the idea that you work inside out is that, you know, you can be incredible fundraiser an incredible salesperson, phenomenal marketing and branding, 
but if you if you're only that on the outside, that's not sustainable. So I really think you have to build inside out. If your relationships within your department, if your support for your student athletes, if your advocacy and alignment and relationships with your campus colleagues, with your chancellor or president of a university, her leadership, his or her leadership team is not there backing up what you're doing externally. I don't, I just don't think it's sustainable. And so I think that's really important. The other piece, and you know, I benefited from probably having a resume that spoke to revenue generation, spoke to the ability to fundraise, create relationships with corporate partners. Um, but I always think the most critical fundraising revenue generate most of our dollars at most of our institutions are going to come internally. So I, I really needed to make sure that I was doing my part internally to tell that story, to advocate, um, to market for the needs, you know, to communicate the needs of our athletics department at, from a revenue generation perspective, knowing that they brought me in because they thought I could also bring in dollars yeah. from external sources. Of course, right. we all have to do that. But <laughs> today more than ever, but it was all, it was really important to, to be able to be really good at internal fundraising too. And I think that sometimes gets overlooked when you think about maybe a young administrator that's trying to become an AD, get in the chair, perform on an interview. I think it's important, uh, especially those on the internal side of things to know what they are doing to accomplish internal fundraising, you know, internal benefits for their athletics department, be able to articulate those and then vice versa. So you understand coming in from the external side that it's really important to, to do your work internally first, in my opinion, and then allow that to, to expand outside. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I want to dive in on the term internal fundraising a little bit, right? Because you're not necessarily talking about raising money internally, or you might be actually, but you're also talking about the social capital of doing a great job within the department as opposed to just looking outward and trying to bring funds from outside in. Expound on that philosophy of internal fundraising for us, please. Some of it's the internal fundraising. I mean, it's obviously important. I think that's it's really important to me that our department and our staff are seen as good colleagues. Um, and it's really important that we can articulate to our campus colleagues what we do in athletics. Um, we are unique. And I think we need to be able to articulate that in a way that's not always asking for more, not always in a needy way, not always asking for exceptions, but educating the rest of campus and making sure that we're aligning ourselves with the rest of campus. So I think it's really important internally to have that friend raising part, right, and, and build those strong working relationships um, with all the different departments that, that we work with. But certainly on the internal fundraising piece, um, you know, most of our budgets, at least at, I think the division two, division three level, this may not be true of the power five anymore. Most of our budgets are still going to come from internal sources, whether that's student fees and your ability to internally fundraise advocating the student government, uh, whether that's sources through tuition dollars that are supporting uh, scholarships, supporting your salaries, whatever it may be that those internal dollars are coming to support. Most of us rely more heavily on, on those dollars than we do the dollars coming from external sources. So I just think it's important that, that we're, we're focused on that and not getting so caught up in donor visits and corporate partnership sales and ticketing and marketing that we're, we're missing the opportunity to advocate internally. So I'll give you an example tied to my time and onboarding here. I came in with a corporate partner packet, something I'd implemented at center college, something I was involved in at UW green Bay. Um, and that was part of my resume, part of what I talked about bringing to UW Parks out in the interview process. First year goes by and I keep getting asked, when are you going to do that? And I, I said, we're not ready yet. And part of that was I wanted to make sure if we were going to launch a corporate partner program, we were ready to be good partners to our, our community businesses and organizations. And we were ready to fulfill the promises that we were making them. But part of it was my focus was I need to internally share to chancellor and our vice chancellor CFO and our human resources director where we are as an athletics department, because that's our best source of funding initially <laughs> is to really understand, to make sure that they understand for me to advocate effectively. Once we got some things done in those areas, now we're doing a lot externally. And, and I think the chancellor appreciates that because she doesn't see it as 
a, a, a one or the other, but a combination of things that we're trying to do to progress the athletics department and, and, and therefore make the institution better. Yeah, I think that's excellent, right? The internal fundraising and then the internal friend raising. I don't know if I understood that at first, but you made it very clear. I, th I think that's an excellent thing. I ask you a couple questions here and then we'll wrap. First is about your relationship with the chancellor. Yeah, and I know y'all believe you sit on her executive staff there at Parkside. So so talk to me about that, the input, especially at Division Two, where sometimes the director of athletics reports up through student affairs or something like that. But you being on the executive staff gives you a little more I guess, seniority and influence in terms of the uh, campus as a whole. Talk to us about that experience coming into it as an AD, but then also the relationship between you and the chancellor there. Yeah, great question, Ty. Something I, I really like sharing with other people. Um, so I'll start with the interview process. Uh, I referenced earlier, 33 years old, first time AD. I didn't have a lot of leverage. I was just happy to get a job offer. I wasn't going <laughs> to I wasn't going to counter with, I'd like X thousand dollars more and a car or moving expenses, anything like that. I was, thank you very much for the offer. Um, not a lot of leverage, but what I did ask for that she was not previously prepared to do was a seat at her cabinet. Uh, it was a direct report, but it did not have a seat at the chancellor's cabinet. And I just, and it kind of goes back to that, that previous question. I just felt like from things mentors had told me from experiences I had had at other places that if I wasn't in the room with all of those other really important members of our leadership team on a regular basis, not just when I needed to talk to them, not just when they needed to talk to me, but when they were talking about what's important in their, in their department, the initiatives that they're working on, the challenges and obstacles that they're seeing that I couldn't truly build those relationships and be ingrained in the entirety of the university. So I just felt like it was a really important thing. She replied to me, be careful what you wish for, but <laughs> yes, you can be on, on cabinet. And uh, I, I remind her of that pretty frequently, definitely last in spring of 2020, when we had 34 consecutive days, including weekends of cabinet meetings, as we were navigating uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was definitely some be careful what you wish for flashbacks <laughs> uh, while sitting through some of those meetings. Um, but I think it's been really important to not just the relationship with her, but also the relationship with with other members of the leadership team. Um, so I'm not just meeting with them when it's about athletics and about what they need from me or what I need from them. But it's it's that broader sense of what's going on with the university. And and it helps with, you know, the M and, and impact is mindful of mission. And I think I can be more mindful and share with our staff more effectively the bigger picture of what's happening at, at our institution. Uh, as it relates to the chancellor, I, and I, all chancellors and presidents are obviously different in terms of the, the cadence with how they want to meet, um, with what they expect, with how they want to conduct meetings. You know, I meet with our chancellor pretty regularly, uh, but I can control most of the agenda. So I try to take advantage of that opportunity and, you know, show up with an agenda that's efficient, shared, shared documents uh, in advance, her really, her only rule is no surprises. So trying to make sure that the things that need to be on her radar are, and I think she appreciates that. My chancellor and myself get along really well because we're both glass half full. We're both much more willing and in, in, in our DNA, we're, we're much more apt to say yes than no. We're much more apt for growth and progress and, and positivity than, than the otherwise. So we, we get along pretty well and I'm blessed to have had her leadership the entire time I'm, I'm here. As we embark on a shifting college athletics landscape, a shift, ever shifting country and earth, right, world in general, I wonder about the makeup of some of the, the discussions that you and your colleagues have in the industry. Like, what are you guys talking about? I mean, I know there you probably the people that you probably went through the NCAA Pathways program with, like there are probably a number of other ADs you talk to, a number of, I mean, just what are some of your discussions like when you talk to other people in the industry? It's a really good question, Ty. And, you know, <laughs> I think we're all, it, it, maybe especially at the Division II level, um, there's a little bit of wait and see. So with that, I think it's important that we're having conversations. I think it's important that we're we're talking about how dominoes may fall, how we can control some of the way those dominoes fall as part of that as well. But one thing that I think a lot about is don't get so caught up in how the industry is changing that it work that I'm not focused on 
how do I make sure UW Parkside is getting better so when the dominoes may fall our way, we're ready for them, right? So I think that there's a balance there that's really important. And, and I've tried to think through that. I don't want to be so consumed with everything happening at the highest level of college athletics and how it impacts Parkside, that Parkside's not ready and, and is in a better place. And however long that is, that maybe the dominoes get to us and we, we make some decisions or we things change at the Division II level. Um, so that's that's one piece of kind of how I try to navigate that. Um, but but I am on the D, D2 ADA board um, and happen to be an officer, just started my, my tenure as an officer this year. So I think as we think about the the NCAA Constitutional Committee review committee that's that's embarking on their work right now. It's trying to find that balance of how do we protect what's really, really amazing about Division II, um, which we feel, I think Division II feels pretty good about where we are. The life in the balance motto and mantra, I think we really live, live that out in our division. And I think, how do we stay true to who we are as a division while also being ready to adapt, whether that's adapting as things kind of fall our way from the top down, or whether that's adapting in, in ways that we can control what we can control as a division. Um, so I think those are some of the things that that we're talking through as a D two ADA board, as officer groups, uh, other leaders within our division, is staying true to who we are, but also you know adapting and, and trying to make sure that we're. We're staying, um, you know, aligned, obviously, with the, with the country and, and collegiate athletics landscape in general. Yeah, that's a probably an ongoing conversation. <laughs> continue, continue, continue. Right. Interesting. Well, Andrew, this has been an excellent conversation. I, I really appreciate you joining us here on the One Question Leadership Podcast. Thanks so much, Ty. Humble to be asked and, and really appreciate it. That was Andrew Gavin. He is a director of athletics at University of Wisconsin Parkside. And of course, this is Ty Brown with one question. And keep in mind, the role of a leader is to create and maintain an environment that people want to be a part of. And as always, be better tomorrow than you are today. This episode of the One Question Leadership Podcast is produced by Spades Media Group, solving problems using creative leadership.